This is Rogers Dry Lake, the 65 square mile heart of Edwards Air Force Base. Its surface of fine clay and silt supports pressures up to 250 pounds per square inch during the 10 months of the year that the lake is dry. The area surrounding this prime facility, known as the Air Force Flight Test Center, contains over 300,000 acres. Its remoteness from large population centers allows testing of classified weapon systems without elaborate security safeguards and permits the testing of new manned and unmanned aircraft and missiles without endangering the civilian populace. The entire 12-mile length of the lake is available for aircraft landings. A running total maintained by the center shows that over $700 million worth of aircraft have been saved since April of 1946. This figure is not the total value of the aircraft involved, but rather an estimate of the damage that would have been done had the dry lake not been available for emergency landings. The value of lives saved cannot be computed. The lake environment is also ideally suited for the zero launching of manned and unmanned test vehicles. The Navy Regulus II missile underwent extensive flight testing at the center prior to being launched at sea from a submarine. This high-speed landing points up one of the advantages of this, the world's finest natural landing field in the recovery of manned space vehicles such as the X-15 and Dinosaur. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration's high-speed flight station is responsible for basic research. Their studies include not only high-speed research aircraft, but also devices for exploring such problems as controllability at high altitudes. Almost all major airframe contractors maintain flight test facilities at the center. Their developmental aircraft are maintained and flown by company personnel. Engine contractors also maintain flight test facilities here. Theirs is the responsibility of improving engine operation within the varied Air Force and Navy aircraft. Development will often continue through the tactical life of the airplane. Contractors Row is adjacent to the Air Force ramp, which is the center of all Air Force flight testing activity. The maintenance and modification hangar has an unrestricted floor space of roughly four acres. The adjoining shops add another four acres of area. Maintenance support of flight test programs requires a capability greater than the normal Air Force depot. The fighter hangar is the center of operations for fighter aircraft test programs. These two hangars are used for the flight test school, new cargo aircraft, and the maintenance of base utility and transit aircraft. Flight test programs require a great amount of technical support and equipment. Facilities for a majority of this support are located immediately behind the flight test ramp. In this portion of the flight test engineering division, military and civilian aeronautical engineers establish the requirements for flight tests. From the data obtained, they can determine the relative acceptability of performance or stability on a test aircraft. Through the use of this digital analyzer, it is possible to predict the performance of high-speed aircraft to various control inputs. This instrument also provides the experimental test pilot with an opportunity to develop and perfect his technique prior to flying the actual mission. The problem shown here is typical of those associated with most supersonic aircraft. This computer has been used with great success on the X-1, X-2, and X-15 programs. This is the pilot's eye view of a high-speed problem which developed during the X-1 program. The pilot was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Yeager. As the rocket engine shut down, the aircraft ended into violent tumbling about all three axes. Control was regained after the loss of approximately 25,000 feet. A successful landing was made on the dry lake bed. Airborne instrumentation plays an important part in flight testing of new aircraft. Here, pressure instrument calibration takes place.
Components are subjected to environmental tests in this sealed chamber. Temperatures can be varied from a minus 100 to a plus 100 degrees centigrade. Whenever possible, the complete racks are built up and checked out in the shop. The master telemetering station is located on a high point away from the main complex. The equipment permits engineers to observe and record up to 42 different responses from an aircraft in flight. As the test mission begins, final calibration is made and the recorders are started. It's down to 230, 220, 210, 200, on back, full stick, it's back to 190, 180, there it goes, right on, right rudder. Okay, it's coming around, there's a half a turn, reversing, passing through 35,000 feet, coming on around, one turn, 30,000 feet, back around again, there's two turns, coming through 25,000 feet, Now it started out, one more turn, passing through 18, looks like you got it made, come on out with it. I'm leveled off at 15, heading for base. The space positioning branch utilizes radar and optical tracking equipment to obtain precise trajectory data for the experiments and prototype aircraft. Through this master station and its nine operating satellites, it is possible to fix the position of an aircraft in space with an accuracy of 10 feet. As the aircraft enters the tracking range for a spin test, ground stations begin recording. This is the initial spin for the prototype of the F-100F two-place jet trainer. All Air Force aircraft must prove their recoverability from spins. In this case, as is often the practice during spin tests, Wingtip deceleration rockets were installed. Their use was ineffective and the anti-spin chute was deployed to no avail. After approximately 28 rotations, the pilot safely ejected. Suitable spin recovery techniques and devices have since been developed. The power plant branch has the complete overhaul and analysis facilities for rocket, reciprocating, and the most modern jet engines. Turbine blades are critically balanced. Engine accessories and components such as fuel pumps and valves are individually tested. The most modern equipment and techniques are used in engine buildup. These test cells can handle engines with thrust ratings of over 50,000 pounds. Data acquired through telemetering, space positioning, airborne instrumentation, and engineering photography eventually comes to the data reduction branch to be reduced to a form of information usable to the aeronautical engineers. Information recorded on magnetic tape is reduced electronically. Tape makes possible a quick readout of test information through the electronic computer. Once the data has been converted from the original source to punch cards, the final step is accomplished. The cards are placed in the computer, the problem set up, and the results permanently recorded in usable form. Aircraft and missile testing require an immense amount of photographic support. This includes both motion picture and still coverage. The photography branch handles approximately 21,000 still prints 
and one quarter of a million feet of motion picture film per month. A high percentage of this is in color. A source of highly qualified test pilots is of primary importance to the center mission. The United States Air Force Experimental Flight Test Pilot School, located at Edwards, has the responsibility of training select pilots in the techniques and procedures for flight testing of experimental and production aircraft. In the eight months course, the student receives 340 hours of classroom instruction in mathematics, aerodynamics, and flight testing techniques. Classroom theories and techniques are put to practical test during the 120 hours that the student pilots the latest jet aircraft. The student gathers his data, reduces it, and prepares a comprehensive written report. Whenever possible, the dangers of manned flight testing are reduced. The experimental high-speed track is used for full-scale testing at high speeds of complete airfoil sections and crew escape systems. A new method of testing aircraft and missile radomes was pioneered by the track branch. A series of studies were made with a missile radome being operated at speeds up to more than twice the speed of sound. As a result of information derived from these tests, materials were developed which can withstand the erosion of rain when an aircraft or missile is flown at supersonic speeds in adverse weather conditions. The TF-102 rocket ejection evaluation is a typical test conducted on escape systems. This run compares the differences between the conventional type and the new rocket booster system. Instrumentation installed in the test dummies records the forces encountered during the ejection sequence. Another organization which deals in the evaluation of equipment for the saving of human lives is the Defense Department Joint Parachute Test Facility at El Centro, California. The Air Force part of the operation is directed by the Air Force Flight Test Center. Testing and development of new types of aerial delivery systems is a major portion of the facility's workload. A standard Army weasel and a one and one half ton trailer are dropped from a Lockheed C-130. The total weight being lowered by the parachutes is 5,440 pounds. highly qualified experimental jumpers evaluates a new parachute design under both static line and free fall conditions. Let us now take a closer look at some of the aircraft which are being tested or have recently completed test programs at the center. The Republic F-105B is a fighter bomber destined for use by the Tactical Air Command. It is powered by a Pratt & Whitney J-75 turbojet engine. Capable at flight at twice the speed of sound, it has an operating ceiling of over 45,000 feet. This aircraft is equipped for in-flight refueling through a probe located on the left-hand side of the fuselage. This provides extended range for worldwide mobility. The Convair F-106A is a new, very high-performance all-weather interceptor produced for the Air Defense Command. 
It is also powered by the Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine. Its armament consists of internally stowed guided missiles. The aircraft is automatic to the point where the pilot is only required to operate the aircraft during takeoff, target lock-on, and the final phase of landing. The North American F-107A was designed as a tactical fighter bomber. A unique feature is its engine air duct located on top of the fuselage. Three of these aircraft were built. Their purpose, determine performance characteristics, study weapon release at high speed, and evaluate the automatic variable area duct. The Douglas C-133 is a long-range transport powered by four Pratt & Whitney T-34 turboprop engines, each delivering more than 6,000 shaft horsepower. With 40,000 pounds of fuel and 50 tons of freight, its range is more than 1,000 miles. The Boeing KC-135 is a high-speed jet tanker which can carry 80 passengers or over 30,000 gallons of fuel. It is designed to have a refueling compatibility with F-101s, B-47s, B-52s, and B-58s. The Convair B-58, the world's first supersonic bomber, is powered by four General Electric J-79 turbojet engines. It is destined for strategic air command operation. The delta-winged body carries a crew of three. Development and improvement of tactical aircraft is a continuing process. Investigation of new techniques, such as the zero-length launch of an F-100D, form a large part of the center's testing mission. During the launch shown here, the aircraft accelerated to approximately 275 miles per hour in slightly more than four seconds. These tests have proven the feasibility of zero-launching modern fighter aircraft from mobile racks in remote sites. In addition to the Air Force test effort, tests of Navy aircraft are conducted at Edwards on a continuing basis. Normally, tests are performed by the contractor with support from the center. In each instance, an Air Force evaluation series is flown by center test pilots. Here is the McDonnell F-4H, an all-weather interceptor powered by two General Electric J-79 engines. One of the most important missions of the Flight Test Center is the operation of the captive missile test site. This complex facility, located 25 road miles east of center headquarters, conducts static testing of high-thrust liquid and solid missiles and missile subsystems for use in such programs as the Atlas, Thor, and Minuteman. Two areas of operation are involved. First, the providing of authorized contractors with test stands, instrumentation, and technical support for the test and evaluation of their power plants and missiles. Second, Air Force evaluation of engines and missile systems. This in-house testing approach is similar to the manned aircraft evaluation philosophy, which has proven so successful. Because of the remote location, an extensive industrial complex has been provided to support testing operations. The missile assembly buildings provide a large open bay area to assemble and check engines and missiles prior to installation on the test stands. This is an early Atlas missile. A size comparison between the men and the missile indicates the large dimensions of these new weapons. This liquid oxygen plant can produce 150 tons of liquid oxygen from the atmosphere each day. The hydrodynamics building has elaborate facilities for testing and evaluating propellant valves and lines prior to their use in test programs. This is the most complete test facility of its type in the nation. This stand is designed for horizontal testing of engines with ratings up to 100,000 pounds of thrust. Developmental work in support of the Minuteman solid propellant ICBM has been assigned to this facility. 
Test stand 1-3 is being used for rocket engine development by Rocketdyne Division of North American Aviation. For these tests, heavy permanent tankage is used. Continuous runs of five minutes are relatively common. Since 1952, several thousand firings have been accomplished on the test stands at Edwards. A major purpose of captive testing is to improve missile reliability by uncovering and correcting design deficiencies. On rare occasions, this process leads to dramatic results. Uncovering deficiencies in this manner can be expensive. However, it is far cheaper to discover design weaknesses of this type on captive stands rather than in free flight. Unlike missile flight testing, heavily instrumented captive runs permit the overwhelming majority of design deficiencies to be detected and corrected without disastrous results. On stand 1-2, the complete Douglas Thor is being subjected to a series of captive flight tests. During these runs, the compatibility of the airframe, power plant, autopilot, guidance and other systems is determined. Test stand 1A has the capability of testing multi-chambered rocket combinations of over one million pounds of thrust. Here the Convair Atlas missile is being subjected to a long duration captive test. Captive testing provides from 10 to 20 times more recorded data than does free flight test. Of more importance is the economic factor, that of repeatedly firing the same static missile. On test stand 1-5, Air Force military and civil service personnel conduct propulsion evaluation programs. Because the stand is designed for testing missile propulsion systems, its tankage is constructed of one half inch stainless steel so that repeated firings may be made. Flame deflectors for tactical sites have also been evaluated on this stand. With the arrival of the North American X-15, the Flight Test Center enters a new era of manned flight testing. This research aircraft is capable of attaining extremely high speeds and altitudes, permitting exploration of aerodynamic heating, stability, and control during winged flight beyond the Earth's atmosphere. Man is also new to the areas this aircraft will explore. During this program, the pilots will be subjected to the psychological and physiological problems of hypersonic and space flight. These space scientists alone can obtain the information needed for a man to break away from the Earth's atmosphere and explore outer space. <laughs>